This is Mike Shutek. Mike builds cars he will never drive. This is John Morton. John builds blood analyzers he will never use. This is Teresa Carter. Teresa constructs television sets whose pictures she will never see. You are part of a system. And because the system is highly competitive, its strength is also its weakness. You must rely on others for the products you use. But if, for instance, you don't have confidence in the skill, training, and attitude of Teresa Carter, a person you never met, you could buy a television set with components built by Sengi Hakaya, who works in Tokyo, whom you also never met. That is your right in the system. Of course, the reverse is also true. If Teresa Carter loses confidence in your ability, she doesn't need what you make. How good are the things you make? How good are Teresa Carter and Mike Schutek? And why is it that a lot of Americans prefer someone else's work? I'm Martin Nagronsky, and I'm an American workman. So are my doctor, my dentist, the people who constructed this building and this street, and the waitress who served me dinner last night. They all have different skills and different capabilities, but they have two things in common. First, they are Americans who work. Second, it has been widely reported that we as a society seem to have begun to lose confidence in their work. Why? For a viewpoint on that, let's switch over to Japan. Like the legendary prophet, the American workman is sometimes honored more in a country other than his own. This is Isatan Company Limited, one of the oldest department stores in Japan. Every industrialized society in the world makes products like toys, and towels, clothing, jewelry, cameras, watches, pens, and tools. The successful retailer does not have to import them over thousands of expensive miles. Isatan has found a reason to. When did you begin to sell American products? Well, that started about 1945. We began gradually, and since then, the volume we handle has been increasing steadily. Mr. Kesu Masako Shiba, manager of Isatan, Tokyo. These American products amount to what kind of dollar volume? Within our last year's sales record, it's equivalent to one and a half million dollars. Why would the Japanese customer choose an American product instead of its local equivalent? I believe that it's the quality of American product that has been appreciated by the Japanese customer. Exactly what do you mean by quality? I believe that there are three points. First is, there is functionality. They are useful. Second, they are very durable, good workmanship. And third, the prices are reasonable. So for these reasons, they are well reputed among Japanese customers. One store in Tokyo does a million and a half dollars worth of business selling the same American products we take for granted toys, small appliances, sporting goods, towels. But it's not just the product that people buy. It's the quality, the workmanship. In Venezuela, 44% of all imported manufactured products are supplied by U.S. manufacturers. In Singapore, it's 22%.
In Spain, it's 14%. In Australia, 24%. Why? For a viewpoint on that, let's switch to Washington in the U.S. Department of Commerce. We asked Dr. Charles W. Hostler, Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Commerce. Uh, Dr. Hostler, how well are American consumer products selling abroad? American consumer products are doing very well, Martin. Uh, they're worldwide. We totaled about $9 billion in 1975 as compared to $6.5 billion the year before. $2.5 billion says they are doing well. That's very true. Dr. Hussler, let's summarize it. Would you say, then, that American consumer goods really hold their own in world markets against any foreign competition? Absolutely. Uh, it means competitiveness in price, prestige, high quality, distinctive styling, attractive packaging, and durability. Durability? Th that's workmanship. Yes, absolutely, Martin. So people in other countries like and respect what we in the United States make. But the ships go both ways. In the past two years, the United States imported more than $200 billion worth of products from other countries. We tend to think of American workmanship in terms of the assembly line. Immense, impersonal, and designed for maximum productivity. Its ultimate end, to produce X number of units per day, per hour, per minute. The American system, terribly familiar by implication. Quantity, not quality. Only this isn't an American plant. This is the Volkswagen assembly works. We are not the only people in the world with assembly lines. But we seem to have a real fascination for foreign assembly lines. Maybe because we don't work on them. Consider, for instance, the automobile. Its impact on life here is absolutely stunning. One of every six people in the United States depends on the automotive industry for their livelihood. But a lot of people besides Americans make cars. And in the past year, approximately 17% of the Americans who bought a car bought one that was made by workers in another country. To give you an idea of what that preference means, consider this. At the request of the New York Times, a Harvard economist did some research and reported that for every $1 billion in lost U.S. car sales, about 58,000 Americans lose their jobs. That means $1 billion equals 58,000 lost jobs. In 1975, import car and truck sales totaled in excess of $8 billion. That's 464,000 jobs. Do the arithmetic again. 58,000 times eight equals 464,000 lost jobs. So this preference for cars built by the workers of other countries has a tremendous impact on our economy. The thing that I can't understand is I come here to take care of my claim. I see all these other people laid off from tire companies and glass factories, car manufacturers. They wait in line to get their money and they go out into the parking lot and drive off in a foreign car. They never put two and two together. It doesn't make any sense to me. The social scientists have pointed out that consumers approach a product not only in terms of its reality, but also in terms of the myth surrounding it. What you believe a product to be is what you buy. But is what you believe reality or myth? Let's take a closer look. The three basic areas of concern for the buyers of most products are how much does it cost to buy? How much does it cost to keep working? How long will it last? All right, let's look at the facts. Fact. Based on manufacturers' suggested retail prices, there are nine cars sold in the United States whose initial purchase price is less than $3,000. Four of these cars, the Gremlin, the Pinto Pony,
the Chevette and the Vega are American. Fact, according to the latest EPA report on fuel economy, 30 of the top 70 rankings belong to American manufacturers. All of these vehicles were ranked at better than 20 miles per gallon in the city, 30 miles per gallon on the highway, and all achieved at least 25 miles per gallon in the combined city highway test. Fact, two of the top six rankings, the Chevrolet Chevette and the Pinto Pony MPG are American. So we are left with how long will this bright, shiny new car last? 84% of all the foreign cars sold here from 1967 to 1970 are still on the road. In comparison, 85% of all the American cars sold during that period are still on the road. So going back nine years, there's virtually no statistical difference between the durability of American and foreign cars. Or you can look at it this way. If, for instance, you are still driving a 1966 Chevrolet, like that one, there are almost a million and a half other people just like you, and about 18 million people who have an American car older than yours. Well, if it isn't price and it isn't a fuel economy and it isn't durability, then what is the difference? I think the foreign car makers take more pride in workmanship. The foreign manufacturer seems to be more interested in the craftsmanship and the quality that goes into his product than in just how many units he produces in a given day. Well, you see, the foreign car is put together differently. They use all kinds of special techniques over there. That's an interesting belief. Let's take a look. This is a Datsun assembly line in Japan. This is a Fiat assembly plant in Italy. This is a Chevette assembly plant in Wilmington, Delaware. These plants have much in common. Their workers take vacations and days off for illness just as anyone else. And they are just as obligated to operate at a profit as any place else. The myth has grown that small foreign cars, especially those made in Europe, are handcrafted by skilled national artisans. Foreign cars are built in plants much like ours by people from many different countries and backgrounds, just as we are. In West Germany, there are more than two and a half million so-called temporary foreign workers. They come seeking work from less industrialized countries, Greece, Turkey, Italy, Spain, Yugoslavia, and many of them find their way onto the assembly lines of the German manufacturing plants. For the most part, they come with limited technical skill. They come to earn a different life, just as American workers of all races, creeds, and ethnic backgrounds gravitated to the industrial centers in the United States. So not all foreign products are built by Swiss watchmakers. On the other hand, who builds American products? It's not like the old days where, you know, just casual, just put a car together and that's it, I, we ship it. But uh, right now, it's quality's everything. Why do you say that? Well, <laughs> if we don't put out good quality, uh, no job, no one buys. Who's gonna feed my family? I've talked to thousands of our guys. I've represented uh, the people in one capacity or another for the past 10 years. And I can honestly say that I don't really know of anyone that I've met who doesn't want to do a good quality job when he's at work in the plant. Well, Mike, would you call that pride? Well, yeah, it's pride. Pride in my workmanship. I call it uh, my responsibility to, my, uh, to myself. That's how some American workmen see themselves and the men they work with. You may see your job and the people who work with you differently. But these views appear to a certain extent to be shared by the managers of a number of foreign manufacturing firms, and by a number of American industrialists as well. Robert Lund is a General Motors vice president and general manager of the largest U.S. automobile operation, Chevrolet. 
Mr. Lund, would you comment on these foreign manufacturers' management decisions to set up operations here in this country? Well, Martin, I don't think it's very surprising to find foreign automobile manufacturers looking to develop assembly facilities here. A lot of economic factors could contribute to their decision. Foreign companies in other industries, Sony and Kawasaki, for example, have had highly successful manufacturing operations in the United States for years. You don't make an investment of that magnitude without that confidence in the quality of your workforce. Listen, isn't a good deal of our success, though, due to purely technological advances? Well, naturally, the bottom line of technology is still people. People who recognize needs, people capable of developing the technology, and most importantly, people capable of operating it. What you really need is a productive combination of all these skills. Well, your bag really are automobiles. Give me an example as it applies to automobiles. Well, if you want to use the automobile as an example, I think you have to look at it this way. There are more than 92 million American-made cars on the road today in this country. And each has something like 15,000 different parts in it. To achieve this kind of quality and productivity, the American worker has to be doing a phenomenal number of things right. The American workman has to be doing a phenomenal number of things right. These century-old steam engines here in the Smithsonian Museum are an example that deserves more than a passing thought. While our grandparents' workmanship went into such innovations, they in turn would have considered as miracles the things that we scarcely notice except when they inconvenience us. We've spent a large part of our time looking at American workmanship in the automobile industry, not because it's the epitome of our craftsmanship, but because one out of every six of us either contributes to or is dependent upon that product for our daily bread. Also, because it's an area of manufacture where we are in direct competition with the workers of many other countries. We are the American workers. We are not some faceless, nameless legion. We are us, you and me. Maybe we are not as good as we can be, but we are better than we believe we are. This has been Martin Nagronsky reporting.